So credit and risk analysis is going to be somewhat different from um, financial statement analysis in terms of stocks. Because with stocks, we're always thinking about what the future payoff is going to be in terms of appreciation of the stock. In other words, returns of future earnings plus the, what we call the terminal value, which would be the value of the stock at the end of the earnings period. So for example, if you were going to analyze the value of a share of stock, what you would want to do is you want to estimate all the future dividends. And then at the end of some time horizon, let's say five years, estimate what the value of the stock is going to be in five years. There are other approaches to take. There's the earnings-based approach, which we're going to use in this course too, future earnings. Cre analyzing credit and valuing bonds is very different. And it's a highly technical process. In fact, not many people do it. It's mostly left to experts who do this for the major rating agencies. Let's go into it in a little bit of detail. We're primarily going to focus on this only in this chapter, and the rest of the book we're pretty much going to focus on equity. So when you're doing credit risk analysis, your goal is to quantify the potential losses so that when you're making your lending decisions, you have all the information that you need. Because the actual future value of the bond or the debt is, is is going to be pretty straightforward it's going to be whatever the principal amount is you're going to receive in the future interest and principal so you know what you're going to receive in the future the question is um there, there's really two questions what is what are the prevailing interest rates going to be so are your interest returns going to be higher or lower than whatever the market rates are going to be and the other issue is the risk of a loss and how much that loss is going to be so what you'd want to do is you want to estimate to estimate your credit loss. That's really the focus of credit risk analysis would be to focus on the ch probability of default and how much you would lose if there was a default. And that involves the same kinds of steps that you would do with equity analysis, but the math is very different. So you, what you want to do is assess the nature and purpose of the loan. Why is this company borrowing money? Assess macroeconomic environment and industry conditions. And what usually the way credit analysis occurs is it's done almost exclusively by industry experts. So you may have a credit analyst in, let's say, auto manufacturing or one common area is municipal debt, where these people only do states, cities, counties, and munis other municipalities. And that's all they do all day long. And they know all about how to do step two. They are experts in that. Whereas equity analysis tends to be a little more diffuse and people may work in more than one industry. In credit analysis, people focus on one industry and that's it. Then you do your financial analysis, estimate your ratios and so on, and then do a perspective analysis, which in, in all honesty is very um, sketchy Equity analysis is also very sketchy, but here the estimating the likelihood of a default and then estimating the amount of the default is a very difficult thing to do. So let's go into step one. What you would do here is you just determine why the company is borrowing the money and how risky is this investment. So it could be just for cyclical cash flow needs, in which case you need to understand the company's operations. It could be to fund losses in which case you know if it's risky or not. It is risky. Fund major capital expenditures or acquisitions. You want to see what the company is buying and how risky are these investors. Or to reconfigure the capital structure, i.e. if the company wants to have a larger percentage of debt on their balance sheet. Most companies maintain a certain capital structure. As I said, a certain percentage of their assets are held in debt. So you may have a debt to asset ratio. As I said, I like the debt to asset ratio, not the debt to equity ratio. You may have a debt asset ratio for a company that's pretty much fixed over many years at 35%. And one day they decide, the board of directors decides that they should really have a little more risk. A little risk would be better for the company. And they decide to raise their debt, their debt ratio up to 40%. So they need to borrow more money. And so what you want to do is you want to understand why are they doing this? Is this going to be something that's good for the company? The next thing is to study the industry. And again, the way this is done in practice 
is that it's done by credit analysts. We have a number of scene hall students who go on into this area. It's a very lucrative area. Um, and they understand their industry as well as anybody at all. So whatever the industry is, let's say restaurants, we're gonna work on restaurants in this class. Restaurants, they're gonna understand the restaurant industry backwards and forwards, who all the players are, and they're constantly researching and updating their research on the industry. They wanna understand what's called buyer power. What this is is, does a company have the ability to demand price concessions from their suppliers? Um, and a good example is I was talking about Walmart before. Walmart has incredible buyer power. It can tell its suppliers whatever it wants. It can say to them, call them in for a meeting. Come on in, we'll have a meeting at 12 o'clock tomorrow. You better be on time. Come in, okay, we'd like to talk to you about your prices. We're not gonna have a discussion. We're gonna talk to you about them. And this is what we're gonna say to you. We're gonna say to you that next quarter, you're lowering your prices by 5%. And if you are a supplier to Walmart, your job, you live in Arkansas, in Bentonville, Arkansas, just to have these meetings. And when Walmart tells you you're going to lower your prices by 5%, you say to them, yes, have a nice day. And that's buyer power. Another thing is supplier power. How easily can you demand higher prices from your customers? Some companies have very strong supplier power. A good example of that is Apple. Apple can set its own prices and people will just pay it. If it's a higher price, a lower price, AT&T, Verizon might ask a few questions because they're, they're real customers, you know. But overall, Apple sets its own prices and if you don't like the prices, you could buy a different product. That's called supplier product power. You'd also look at threat of substitution. This is the ability of other products to take the place of your products. Oftentimes there are different products. A good example of substitution would be TV advertising as opposed to cable and various different um, other forms of entertainment. If people don't want to um, watch TV, they can go to Netflix. So it's kind of the same product. They do compete, but they're somewhat different products. Threat of entry would be the ability of other companies to come in and cre in cre create competition. And certain industries are in very, um, have very high threat of entry and certain industries have very low threat of en entry. One with high threat of entry is restaurants. It's not difficult to start a restaurant chain. One with low threat of industry would be semiconductors. Semiconductors are pretty much made by two companies in the United States, and it's very difficult to compete with those companies because the amount of technology that they've invested and research and development that they've invested in is so high that you can't crack that market. Another one is, by the way, pharmaceuticals. You have a patent on a certain medication, and no one can. the only way that anyone can compete with you is if they can invent a better medication. The next thing you would do is you'd go through your financial analysis. And this means doing the same kinds of financial statement ratios that we've been talking about all along. And one thing which you're gonna do is, we're gonna talk a lot about this in the next few chapters, is to adjust those financial statements to get more accurate ratios. What you're gonna do is you're gonna exclude certain things that may distort your operations. And you're going to do it in credit analysis. Of course, you're going to do it in equity analysis. We're going to talk a lot about this in the coming chapters. And you're going to do a full profitability analysis as part of this. So you're going to compute return on net operating assets, net operating profit margin, net, um, net operating asset turnover. But you want to exclude items that may be misleading you say, but how can financial statements include items that misleading? Financial statements are prepared with GAAP, and sometimes GAAP requires companies to put things in there, or managers may use good judgment to put certain things in the financial statements that you may feel do not necessarily represent the company's performance going forward, and therefore you would exclude those. And again, we're going to talk about this in the next chapters. 
Then we have what we call perspective analysis. And this would be trying to predict what's going to happen in the future. So adjusting your financial statements, assuming the company were to borrow more money or whatever else it is that you think is going to happen in the future, computing those ratios in the future to see if they're going to see what's going to happen. I'll give you an example of perspective analysis. I had a client. I wor- I've I used to work as an accountant. I don't really do it so much anymore. But I had a client that wanted to buy a hotel. And it was, you know, a relatively small hotel. And so we needed to do the math. Okay, how much are you going to charge per room? What are your operating costs going to be? And going through all the various, everything we knew about what the, how this hotel was going to operate. I'll tell you, I really tried. I spent hours poring over my spreadsheets. And I could not find any way that this hotel was going to be profitable. The problem was, was that they were borrowing money to fund it. And the interest payments on the debt were so high that they couldn't possibly make enough money to pay them. And so the only possibility here was that this thing was going to lose money. It was very easy to put it in a spreadsheet and just to show you're going to lose money every year. So the only way that this thing is going to survive is if you continuously put more money in over the coming years. You just keep borrowing more and more money and you know where that's going to be headed to, right? So a lot of times you'll do this perspective analysis and you say, well, what's going to happen? And then you discover that, hey, this is too much debt for this company. And therefore, or the comp- this project itself is just not going to work. We, we can't find any, any, or it'll only work if you make unreasonable assumptions. So we could work this project, but we're not going to have any maintenance. Or we can work as long as the managers work for free. We could do this, but we can't, we have to cut employee salaries below minimum wage. So what can often happen is that when you're doing these analyses, and I'm speaking now from a, from an investor or a, a deal making point of view, you do these analyses and you discover that using realistic assumptions, it's just not going to work. And that would be the point where you have a big meeting and you say, guys, Ladies, this is not, the way you're structuring this deal right now is going to fail. Um, I charged that guy a lot of money, but it was worth it because he would have lost a lot more money if he had gone on with the deal. Anyway, you have what we call loss given default. What would happen if this company went under? And the key there is to understand the creditor's priority among other debts. So if you just have a general note without any collateral, then there's a very high chance you're gonna, there's a good chance that if there is a default, you're gonna get nothing. But if you have some collateral, then that may mean that you have the ability to take certain property that would cover your loss. So some tools that you can use to assure that you don't have to, to try to limit that loss. One would be a credit limit, obviously, that they just can't borrow more than a certain amount of time at a time. Also, a repayment of term that they have to repay it over time because they might not be able to accumulate sufficient money at the end of the debt. So you just require them to make annual or monthly payments or semi-annual payments. Collateral would be where you have certain collateral that if the company goes into default, you could just take the collateral and walk away and that will cover your loss. And covenants would be where you have certain requirements that the company has to follow in order to stay out of default. And you want to somehow balance these things so that the company can function and be profitable while not taking too many risks with your money, your money. So credit limits would simply be to set the maximum amount of money that the debtor is allowed to borrow. It seems pretty obvious, but this is a good way to limit your loss. And you could set lower credit limits for new customers versus established companies. This is especially important, by the way, obviously for a note, There's going to be a credit limit for a revolver. There's going to be a credit limit. Bonds are just a fixed amount of money to borrow. But credit limits will be a big issue in trade credit. So if you're you're issuing, 
if you're allowing your customers to pay you on credit, in other words, you deliver the goods and they pay you later, then setting a credit limit will force your customers, will, will avoid a situation where your customers owe you too much money. And it may mean sometimes that if the customer has borrowed too much and hasn't paid you back, you stop shipping them merchandise or you say the only way we can send you this order is if you give us the money in advance you quit or cash on delivery you pay us when we deliver the goods so that requires very careful management because you want to loan them you want to give the customer enough credit so that they'll keep buying from you and they'll be happy customers but you don't want to give them so much that they can't pay you back collateral is property that the borrower has pledged to guarantee repayment. And the way the deal works is that if the borrower goes into default, then you get to keep the collateral. So usually what you're looking for is you're looking for real estate or what's even better are securities that you can just sell. So one common form of collateral, believe it or not, is accounts receivable. When retail, when, um, in the retail industry, if you have a supplier, let's say a clothing company, selling goods to a retail chain like Macy's, then as soon as Macy's buys the merchandise, let's take the supplier, let's take um, Tommy Hilfiger, for example. Tommy Hilfiger will, as soon as they deliver the merchandise, they'll run over to the bank with the accounts receivable and the bank will loan them money using the accounts receivable as collateral. This is great collateral. Because if Tommy Hilfiger defaults, then the bank has the accounts receivable and it can just collect the money from Macy's. That is, you know, if Macy's stays in business. Repayment terms are the other one. You want to set your repayment terms so that they're going to be reasonable and they're going to work for the customer. The, they should also match whatever it is the customer is doing with the money. So, for example, if the purpose of the loan is to fund cyclical operations, then the repayment term should be six months, nine months, a year, because you have an annual cycle. There's a period of the year when they don't have any money. There's a period of the year when they do have money. So they borrow the money when they don't have money. And then later on, when the company has money, they pay it back. And that would be setting your repayment terms in a healthy way. Another example would be if you're buying equipment, you would want your loan period to reflect the life of the asset. So you would not want to fund a five year life asset with a 10 year debt. It's an interesting thing I was reading about car loans and people are taking out car loans for five or six years sometimes. And they might not actually have the car for five or six years. So they're in this process, they buy a car and they buy a new car every three years. It doesn't make sense to borrow money for six years because you'll be paying off the car for a longer period of time than you actually own it. Now, of course, you're going to sell the car and you use the money. Pay, but what makes more sense is that the debt period should reflect how long you're actually going to drive the car. And then finally, covenants. Covenants are extremely important. What covenants do is they create certain limits on the borrower so that the borrower can't do certain things that would make it more difficult for them to pay off the debt. For example, let's say that you have, um, you have, you're giving, you're loaning money to the borrower so they can buy equipment. You'll have a debt covenant that says they can't sell the equipment or that they can't merge. They can't buy another company. They can't borrow more money. And these, obviously, you also have ratio requirements. They can not have a certain debt to asset ratio above a certain amount because you don't want them borrowing more money until they've paid you back. So these are some examples of how you could control the amount of money that the debtor loans so that to assure increase the likelihood that they're going to pay you back. Next, we're going to talk about different credit risk measures.